Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Robbie Basil Show. Apologies for no video on Saturday. I knew a lot was happening. We actually had a video planned and a video that was almost fully recorded. Uh, but due to my old Wi-Fi, um, it broke down. It like crashed and everything got deleted. I have some good news on that, though. Uh, we recently got a new Wi-Fi, which is f like nine times the speed or ten times the speed of the old one because i am recording this on a on a, on a website plot on a on riverside which is a website online so yeah we'll be hopefully we won't have that problem again with the brand new wi-fi it's like 300 megabytes download so it's way better than my original one uh additionally uh we will be doing a video soon with kyle levinson of sports come first he will be joining me to talk nba free agency but we're not doing that today because Kyle can't make it so we have our usual stuff to talk about we had Wimbledon get really crazy and me not being able to predict absolutely anything it just proves how bad I am at predicting tennis or how unpredictable tennis can be we had Copa America turn to absolute madness in the quarterfinals we'll talk about all of those games unfortunately no basil breakdown today because I'm on a time crunch Friday we will have basil breakdowns return uh, additionally, we had a crazy British Grand Prix. We'll break down the whole thing and why Lewis Hamilton finally got win number 104. But we begin today with the Euros. Now, we go back to Friday, and we made it to the quarterfinals. If you don't remember where we were in the tournament, we are at the quarterfinals of the whole thing. It's Spain-Germany. We had France take on Portugal. We had Netherlands, Turkey, and England, Switzerland. We will start with Spain and Germany, because that was the first game, of course. I wasn't really able to... I didn't get to watch it live. I watched most of it back. Oh, my God, what a game I missed. Oh, my days. What a match. Absolutely miraculous. It's exactly the type of result you were thinking of an extra time thriller two sides that were very evenly matched but at the end of the day Spain's a little more quality and a better form got them through in the end in Stuttgart Danny Oma opened the scoring but Florian Wirtz who's been probably one of the best if not like a he's a top three attacking midfielder possibly in the world right now in terms of form he's been so good he had a big game as well here. He scored. But then, dramatics in the end, because that's what this tournament is. Uh, a 119th minute go-ahead to go from Spain. And then you're probably questioning why Carvajal got a red card. He basically took somebody out. It's denial of, a, it's denial of everything, essentially. And he was shown a red card. Though, people were questioning why he even did it in the first place. And, well, I see it as something very simple. He was suspended for the semifinals anyway because of yellow card accumulation from the last two matches. Because remember, yellow card accumulation resets when the round of 16 begins. Carvajal got a yellow in the round of 16 match. He gets a yellow here, so he's suspended. So he decides, no, screw it. I'm going to save my team, do uh, take one for the team, and he goes out and gets a red. And that's basically how the game ended. Uh, Spain beats Germany in one of the most intriguing matches of the whole thing. A flair for the dramatics for sure as the Spanish beat the Germans to advance to the, to the next round. Fair play. Uh, the next match we have on display was Portugal against France. Now, I, you knew what was on the line when you look at this match. Could it be the last dance of the Euros for Cristiano Ronaldo? Can France score a goal from open play? What are we gonna? What type of Portuguese side are we gonna see? Are we gonna see some of the stars we haven't seen a lot, who haven't played a lot? Are we gonna see them? Well, we got our answer pretty fast for the majority of these. Uh, this game was pretty mid. I'll be honest. Mid is a way to put this. Nil nil. This was the worst quarterfinal match by a country mile. Now, uh, this game was nil-nil. 
each team had a couple of chances, but not really that many. Uh, just to show you how stupid this run is, France has gotten to the semifinals without scoring a goal from open play that's not an own goal. That's miraculous. Their only true goal was an Mbappe penalty. That's it. Everything else has been an own goal. They had the own goal against Austria, and they had the own goal against Belgium. This is just getting out of hand now. And here we are, with nothing making any sense. Uh, Joe Felix missed a penalty. That was essentially it, because France t went first. They converted all five. Joe Felix hit the post, and that's the game. Uh, Ronaldo finishes his last ever Euros in the quarterfinals in Hamburg, which... I'm not going to lie, it kind of felt like they were going to get eliminated in the last round when they struggled with Slovenia, or Slovakia, or whoever the hell it was. And now they're eliminated to a team that's on paper better than them. Now, what we heard recently is that it will not be the last international tournament, tournament for Ronaldo. We will probably see one last dance for Ronaldo and Messi in a World Cup in 2026, which probably bumps up the prices for every single World Cup match, no matter what it is, because it's Messi, Ronaldo, whoever. But in this tournament, I forgot to mention this with the Germans, we've seen the end. It's the end of an era, essentially, what these two matches showed. We saw the end for, in the previous match, Thomas Müller. We saw the end of Toni Kroos. In this match, you see the end of Ronaldo, Pepe, and possibly multiple others. We'll talk about England, Switzerland, Netherlands, Turkey, but no one big from that. I mean, this tournament's somewhat been the beginning of an end, really showing the beginning of the end, because now you're going to start to see the retirements from either the national team or this tournament, because the next Euros is in four years. We probably won't see most of the stars, the older stars, in that tournament in four years, in 2028. I, which I believe is in, like, the, is it the UK? I actually don't know. I think it's, like, Ireland, Scotland, and... Hold on. I actually want to know this. Because I should know this, but I don't. Um, it's, it's England, Scotland, Ireland, and Northern Ireland. Fair. Fair enough. You do you, guys. Uh, but that's how that game ended. Uh, France... Once again, makes the semifinals without doing absolutely anything. Par for the course for them, isn't it? Uh, additionally, just wanted to make an announcement. Um, when the Premier League comes back, I don't know if I'm doing the Premier League predictions with somebody again. I'm going to do one at least from my perspective. We're going to show you possibly some hot, like, we'll show you, uh, give you a better on screen description of what each team did, and we'll show you my full uh, predictions at the end of the video. But I don't know if I'm doing this with somebody yet. We will. I think the plan right now is going to be full breakdowns of, like, most of the games. And, like, if it's, like, a nil-nil, we aren't going to really go into it that much. But if there's, like, controversy, we'll do more basal breakdowns. I'm hopefully going to be editing videos. I'll go actually, like, going more in deep in editing videos, which might mean that videos might be going to once a week. I don't think it will, but it's possible. Based on my schedule. So that is likely the plan for September. For me to possibly go more in depth with videos. But no promises yet. I'm still like trying to figure out. Some of the stuff or the logistics. Of how uh, a schedule for this show could work. Uh, apologies if I'm looking down my phone. I'm possibly getting notifications from somebody very soon. Uh, additionally. Um, this is an early update. It's very possible this show goes back to Monday, Friday. It's possible. What might happen is I might record on Monday and post it on Tuesday. That's a very big possibility. Or we go back to Monday, Friday, for at least for the upcoming semester, where I'm talking about games on Monday, at previewing Monday Night Football. On Friday, we review Thursday Night Football after Into the Stands. Hopefully, we have more Into the Stands news coming your guys' way soon, so... All of that news probably will be coming very soon. At least that's the hope. But right now, there's just a lot of up in the air stuff. And speaking of up in the air stuff, what the hell was this? Was is England? Is uh, England? Jesus Christ, guys! You know, England are truly special. They really are. And 
they've looked poor in both of their last two matches. Really, really poor. But I will give them some some benefit of the doubt here. And let's talk about this game. It's England-Switzerland, uh, which was supposed to be the game that we watch highlights for, but it's unfortunately not. Um, England wins in Dusseldorf. Uh, unpredictably, England actually wins an important match on penalties. Let's talk about it. Buren Bolo, awesome game from him. He scores to put Switzerland up. It was chaos. No one knew what was happening. And England were in big trouble for all of five minutes. Bukayo Saka, who's played after a couple of changes. Saka goes back to the right after playing f wing back for like 90% of this game. Goes up his, uh, his first real attack off the right wing. Cuts it back on his left foot. Off the post and in. Curls it off the left post and in. England levels it, which takes us to extra time. Nothing happened. We were playing for penalties. Switzerland missed a penalty. England converted all five, including a Trent Alexander-Arnold finishing penalty. And England, who've looked really bad, are through to the semifinals. Sure. I don't hate it. I mean, I mean, listen, it's a team with a lot of talented players that are starting to really f maybe find a groove. I mean, they're finding the groove in the penalty spot. Maybe we see it here? I, I don't know. I, I just don't know. But England, they dominated possession. They were swaggering all over the field. They had a couple of chances, but they couldn't fish, finish absolutely anything, which put them into the situation that they were in. Switzerland scored, but England, really for the first time for me in a while, responded really, really well. They didn't really panic. Southgate adjusted his tactics, I think, perfectly fine. And Saka goes up on the right wing, cuts it off. It's an Arsenal special, it feels like, from him. And then puts one in the back of the net. Now, could have England scored multiple goals in this game? Absolutely. But England's goal scoring has been their biggest problem. Their defense has kind of held up better than what we thought. Remember, they didn't have their returning England captain and Harry Maguire. There were questions with some of the inexperience and the lack of center backs on this team. But Gareth Southgate has made it work, and which is more impressive. Because remember, England fans were calling for this guy to be sacked, but he's, I think, taken in the more semifinals recently. Like, I don't remember the whole stat. Um... Let me find it, actually. We'll pull it up. Gay, what is it, records? His record as England manager, 64% wins, which is not great. Took charge of the national team 2016. And he's actually going to become a knight, which is actually going to be kind of sick, so... Shout out to Garrett Southgate. He's rumored to now, uh, according to the Telegraph, he's tipped for knighthood even if England lose, uh, which, fair, because he's won them a lot of matches. But England, through to the semifinals, and who are they playing? Well, that would be another unpredictable match between Netherlands and Turkey. Now, this game was so fun. I didn't miss the second half. Well, I did get to watch the second half back recently, and oh my days, the Netherlands. Turkey scored in the first half, made it one goal to nil. But the Netherlands, late on, courtesy of a... This is where the names get back to me. Diverge and a Mert Milde own goal um, sealed the deal. After Sama Ak Akaidin, totally did not butcher that. If you know, you know, chat. If you know, you know. Um, Turkey goes on to lose a very valiant, valiant effort by the Turks. But the Dutch finally uh, go on to do something good. Because they've struggled in the group stage. But they went on and annihilated Romania last week. And here they are on a Saturday afternoon going on and beating Turkey. Sure. I don't hate this. Do you guys hate it? I don't know. But the Netherlands, they looked good for the majority of this. They, the, What was the question for them? The lack of finishing in the final third. That was their weakness. And what did they do? 
They made some adjustments. They pushed up the field late. They get a set piece goal with Diverge, and then they get an own goal late on. Sure, I don't hate it, but we now have... <laughs> I hate this part. Welcome to the semi... I mean, someone I saw on Reddit... So this is the semifinals featuring the teams of it's colonialism at its finest, is what they say. And with all they're technically not wrong, I don't necessarily... I mean, it's not all foreign players, remember, for these teams. I mean, you talk about it, what's, what's, how, that leads us into the semifinals. It's Spain against France and England against the Netherlands, which goes back to 17, like the 1750, or like the 18th century of colonialism. But we're not talking about colonialism. We're talking about football. I mean, people will talk about it with France because, like, half their national team is, like, over half the national team's not technically from, like, France. Like, half, and French Guyana is here. But it's all territories, which comes back to France. So it's technically not, it's technically legal and sets us up for these two dramatic contests. We have Spain against France. No one's going to, no, no one knows anything that's going to happen. It happens to. It's happening today. This gonna be. This video actually will go live during the match, which is pretty unfortunate due to the timing of this video. But the big question for me is gonna be: Can France actually put one in the back of the net? If they actually can score, I like the French in this because of their experience in major tournaments. The issue for them is going to be their goal scoring's been abysmal. Like I said earlier, zero goals. Zero. Zero goals. Uh, zero. Zero. You can see through my eyeballs. That's not a good circle. There's a circle. Zero goals from open play. In regulation and extra time and anything. Own goals do not count as goals from open play by your own team. So if France can actually score a goal in regular time, I kind of like them in this matchup. Spain scores, they're not losing. If Spain scores, they're totally not losing. They've been the best team in this tournament, and it's not even close. I, I don't even know. I'm not even going to pick a winner. We're just going to preview the games. And your other side, it's Netherlands against England. I think the two best teams out of this whole bracket. We're going to take a look at the whole thing again. And if you really look at it, you have, I think, the two best teams in the whole part of the tree going head-to-head -head in a semifinal. I think it's perfect. England, questions about them with Southgate's tactics. Southgate hasn't really adjusted that much, although it kind of worked. Late on against the aforementioned Swiss, which sucks that the Swiss went out, by the way. They had a valiant effort as well. They're going to go up against the Netherlands team that's looked really, really strong, especially in second halves, which is going to be fun to mention for England. Uh, I like the Netherlands winning that game, though. I'm going to actually pick a winner for this one. I'm going to go with the Netherlands. I think a lot of people want the Netherlands to win. And I can't blame them because of all the uh, the media attention that England gets. Or, like, I don't even know what the right term would be for this. But the, all the love the England get, England's, English get from the media, from this to that, especially back home. It's like glazing, I think, is the course. as a term some kids use, but... I like the Netherlands. I think it's going to be Netherlands against Spain, which sets us up for like a Euro final, like a tournament final from the early 2010s. I'm trying to remember. I, I know Spain Netherlands was a final in something. Was it, um, was it 20? No. When was this final? Was it 2010 World Cup? I think it might have been. Hold on, pause this. I'm going to try and look at this. Because if it's Spain and Netherlands, I think it's the final of 2010. Yeah, it is. So we would have a, a rematch of the 2010 World Cup final 14 years later. I think that would be awesome. But you guys are going to have to check out the matches today and tomorrow, 3 Eastern on, I believe that's on Fox. Uh, today, it's it's France and Spain. Tomorrow, it's England, Netherlands. Uh, we'll, ha we'll continue the footballing theme, and we're going to head over to Copa America. Now, the Copa America is a controversy for multiple reasons. Some I'll address right now. You have referee controversies, which also happened in the Euros because there's like a referee who like took a bribe that's refereeing the England-Netherlands semifinal that I'm not really going to go into yet because I don't know the full details still. 
Uh, I've got like bits of pieces, but not the whole thing. But if you remember in the Copa America, the biggest headline at the end of the group stage was the U.S. getting eliminated. But the teams that we were most concerned with, uh, I had a, a lot of concerns with, was Brazil and Canada. Because we did not know how that Canadian team was going to look. But we will start with uh, Argentina. They were playing Ecuador. This game was awesome. I did get to watch this. I watched most of these quarterfinals, actually. And we had Argentina on penalties. <laughs> Let's talk about the penalty shootout. We opened the penalty shootout. First of all, it's 1-1. We opened the penalty shootout with a messy Penenka, which was so fitting, yet he hit the crossbar. But then Emi Martinez is a demigod and saves a couple of pens. Argentina converts everything else, including a finishing a finisher from Giovanni Lo Celso. That's the game. Sure. I, mean, I don't hate it. Do you guys hate it? I mean, let's look at the details. We'll take a look at this and we'll look at all the sponsors. Emmy Martinez is a god. Um, uh, we had Lissandro Martinez for the opening goal. It was um, Giovanni Lo Celso, right? Yeah, it was Giovanni Lo Celso. Um, so I was right. It was Giovanni Lo Celso. I know I didn't show the show the show the, the shootout, um, but Giovanni Lo Celso scoring the winning penalty. Very physical game. Not a lot of cards. That's been the other theme. We need more yellow cards. Like referees. Very simple. Take the card out. There you go. I'll block the sun for y'all. It's a yellow card. Yellow. I think it's. That's not, I don't, I don't want to butcher the Spanish for that, but we're not even going to try it. But that we need more of them. Just like this blinding light, which I hope, hopefully that's a little bit better. The questions going to be for the rest of the way are how's the officiating going to be? We've seen so many problematic officials in this tournament, theme for later, by the way. And it's not been a great look for this tournament. It's been a bad look for UEFA and for Connemble. But another bad look for Connemble was Venezuela against Canada. Now, Canada was the highest ranking CONCACAF team to make the knockouts. They got out of a somewhat easy group after Chile and Peru didn't want to beat each other. That's the only reason Canada is really here because of a late winner against Peru. And what did Canada do? Well, uh, the maple syrup land won. I'm not going to question this. Are you guys going to question this? I'm all for this. We ride and die with Canada. Maple Leafs and maple syrup land have gone on and beaten Venezuela, which raises the concerns for Venezuela as well because they lost to a much lower ranked team than them. I believe they're, I, I mean, in terms of quality, I would say Venezuela is better than Canada, though if you're talking about who's the best player on the field, it's Alfonso Davies, not even close. But if you're asking for which team I'd rather have, I'd say right now in terms of form, Venezuela, of course. I mean, they beat Ecuador, they beat Mexico. Like, who wouldn't want a team like this? Well, Canada, apparently, because they beat Venezuela. So Canada goes on and wins. In a penalty shootout, in a dramatic penalty shootout, the penalty shootouts are a theme for Saturday as well, which we'll talk about in a minute. So Canada is now going to play Argentina in MetLife Stadium tonight, which if you're traveling to New Jersey, have fun. If you're traveling on the on the Long Island Railroad, have fun. Because at, or like the New Jersey Transit, have fun because that is gonna be an endless war, because of how many people are are, are expected to go to that football match. It's gonna be absolutely crazy. So Canada is playing Argentina, and we know how crazy this game can get. But what happened on Saturday? Because it was Colombia against Panama. And Brazil against Uruguay. And a lot could happen in either match. Well, I'll just tell it to you straight. Panama got ran off the pitch. 5-0 Colombia. Bro, Panama just got outmatched. But I think the U.S. would have lost by more. Because the U.S.'s defense looked way worse than Panama's defense when they played each other. 
Panama lost 5 0. The Canal Boys are gone. And the entirety of Group B, not named the United States, uh, not named Uruguay, celebrating their demise. I mean, Uruguay kind of wanted to face Panama in the next round if they get past Brazil. Which is where we'll head to next because there's not a lot to break down in the Colombia game. They dominated possession, they were dominant everywhere, and they scored five goals. What else do you want me to say? But it's the other match that had more people's attention. We are heading to Las, Ve Las Vegas. It's Brazil. It's Uruguay. Two nations that are right next to each other. Two nations that have never liked each other. An essential war will be going bet between these two on a non-regulated football pitch in Las Vegas. And how does this end? I've said that penalty shootouts were a theme. Ladies and gentlemen, more penalty shootouts. Brazil and Uruguay played the worst match of the round, and it's not even close. Nothing happened other than, like, people fighting each other. That's it. Brazil and Uruguay... Listen, Brazil couldn't make a penalty to save their life for the most part. And shout out to Gabby Martinelli of Arsenal for converting a penalty. But Uruguay, better from the spot goes on to advance to the common the Conmebol Copa America semifinals where they all face Colombia which that game will be much more exciting as we now take a look at your semifinals Tuesday we have the aforementioned Argentina against Canada on Wednesday we will be going to North Carolina where Uruguay will face Colombia in a match that is so much more balanced than the other one this game should be actually watchable so Listen, I'm all in it for both games. Both games are going to be extremely fun. I'd rather watch uruguay Colombia because I think Argentina is going to boss Canada off the field. Because we've seen this game already. In the opening match. Argentina played Canada in the opening match and Canada got ran off the field. It should have ended like 17 to nothing. But Argentina couldn't finish anything. So while people are talking about, oh my god... Messi and Ronaldo being terrible, we're going back to this game where Messi could have had like seven goals. It is going to be very interesting. Argentina should win that game at MetLife, but the Canadians, I think, are going to come out to this because it's like New York's kind of close to the Canadian border. Like some, I mean, some of it's right on the Canadian border, but that's not the point. I think the Canadians will show up. I think Argentina wins that game 2-0, and I have Uruguay losing to Colombia. I think Colombia is the best informed team of the whole thing. I have Colombia winning 3-1 over Uruguay in extra time. But to set up Argentina, Colombia in the final, which is what I should have made the final in the first place, because that was what I was originally going to go with, but I could not pick Brazil. So... Could not 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 pick Brazil, so I I I went with Brazil and that looked really stupid. But Argentina Colombia on on the weekend would be an awesome final. We'll preview the final, which I believe is on Saturday night. No, it's Sunday night. Waiting all day for Sunday night. You know, you guys know. You know, you, you, if you know the song, if you know, you know. Uh, but that's that situation. And we also have a little bit of transfer news. So, buckle your seatbelt to your chat. We have some transfer news. And we will start with Arsenal. Because they have been somewhat active. The main two te three teams in question today are Arsenal, Manchester United, and Juventus. We'll start with Arsenal. Who have likely gone on and signed Ricardo Calafiori from Bologna. Now, Arsenal have been linked with multiple different moves, including the possible sale of William Saliba, which I don't, as not even as a biased Arsenal fan, which I'm not. I am a fan of the team, but I'm never biased towards them. You have to imagine that Arsenal are likely not selling Saliba. I think they're going to put Calafiori at left back, which we're going to have be like the equivalent of the Himalayan Mountains at defense, because everyone's going to be over like 6'2". Ben, I think Ben White's pretty tall, but we'll have Ben White, it'll be Calafiori, Saliba, and Gabriel with Timber playing everywhere off the back line. And that's the type of player that I like with Calafiori, because I think he can play both left back, he can play left center back if you really want him to. Arsenal are going to pay a, a premium to get him, but he's 22, and he's going to be a player for the future, likely on a five-year deal. I like the move. 
Another move I like is Manchester with Manchester United. Now, they, now they were linked with Jared Braithwaite, but they immediately had a move rejected today, a bid of $45 million plus add-ons. But they're now rumored to sign Matthias De Ligt to play center half. Now, I like them. I, I love Matthias De Ligt. I think it's a perfect move for Manchester United. They need to overhaul the center back core. Varane's gone, likely. He's linked with Como in Italy. And you like they're trying to probably sell Casemiro, which to get rid of the wage. So I think I like the move. The Lick's gonna be part of the overhaul. I mean, listen, they signed both the Brainthwaite and Delict. Their defense is gonna be upgraded by tenfold, and it's gonna be really interesting to see. But they were also rumored in the sale of Mason Greenwood. That move has turned up a little bit. There was a rumor, uh per Fabrizio Romano, of a possible sale of Mason Greenwood, who's been under like controversies for multiple years. I won't go into it due to what the controversy is. He's been linked. He was on loan at Getafe last season in Spain. He's now linked to a move to Olympic Marseille, which I liked the move for both of them. New start for Greenwood after being in such controversies in England, and United have wanted to get rid of him for like forever. Well, they should have got rid of him earlier, but there you go. So he would likely be off the books. Their next likely sale will be Jaden Sancho, who's been linked with like a couple of teams as well. But they'll probably get to that once they finalize the likely signing of Delict and likely the sale of, I think, Mason Greenwood. The only problem that I think of this, that's going to be an issue with the sale of Mason Greenwood is the, uh, I think it's like the buy, but it's not the sell-on clause. Because Manchester United, if they, he gets sold again, uh, we, we're trying to get out a, a big sell-on percentage, which I don't think is going to work. And what I think could be a possible reason this deal could break down is what the percentage they're asking for is. It's pretty high. And here's what they say. Uh, it's it's prob- pr- pretty much in the 40% range, which is a lot for a player like him, but... Uh, but like I said earlier, Manchester United's big move right now is Matthias De Ligt, the Dutch international, I think will be signing with Manchester United by the end of next week, except as, as well as the move for Ricardo Calafiori, I think happens by the weekend for Arsenal. Uh, additionally, oh great, my Wi-Fi is down, but we'll see if we can get through the rest of this video. Uh, we will not be, no longer be doing, uh, we're having a little bit of technical issues again. So, you might be GG's by the end of this, but we'll see. We'll see. Uh, to continue this, continue what's going on right now. Um, hold on one second. Just doing a check real quick. My apologies. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a little bit down right now, my Wi-Fi, so... Listen, hopefully we get through the end of this video, but back to what's going on. Formula 1 is next, and what a race we had. We'll start off with qualifying, which went down to the wire between George Russell, Lewis Hamilton, Lando Norris, and Max Verstappen. Well, Verstappen finished fourth, and people were really on the edge of their seats for what could happen next. And what happened next was wild. We had Oscar Piastri not get pole position. I believe he actually, that's the last race. Uh, what happened with the lap getting deleted. But then we had Lando Norris jump the pole. Lewis Hamilton jump the pole. But it ends the day. The day ended with the British driver of George Russell leading the way. It was a British one, two, three. And we likely were trying to see something like that in the race. Unfortunately for them, the Mer- a Mercedes broke down. A hydraulics failure from George Russell. A serious hydraulics failure. Ended his day in the middle, of, in the round lap 33. But what ha- what happens next is wild. Pit stop, the strategies were out the window from McLaren. They bottled it again. Mercedes nailed it. Because at the end of the race, about 15 laps to go, uh, the drivers, so around the 30s, they went to inters, the 30s or 40s, so they went to intermediate uh, tires. But then something really interesting happened. Now they had a chance to go back to slicks. And and the commentary, commentary team of Crofty and Martin Brundle 
said it very well. This should be the medium tire. You know, it's a more balanced. It has some speed, but more grip um, over a longer period of time. And what happened next was kind of interesting. Some cars sped and in, went into the pits, and that tire was going. The tires they picked were very interesting, but the team that nailed it for the wrong reason was McLaren again because they went with Oscar Piastri pitting for medium tires, which is what Lando should have gone on. But Lando and their <laughs> It's like, a, I'll, I'll word it like this. It's like when you don't know what to get on the menu at a restaurant. Do you? Do I want the steak? Do I want the roasted chicken? Do I want the sushi? Do I want a pasta? Or one of the four? I don't know what to choose. What type of pasta? You know, you get what I mean, right? And everyone's indecisive. That's what McLaren was because they were indecisive about, about a tire. They put Lando on softs. It lost him the race. McLaren, which is the fastest car, finishes third on a strategy blunder yet again. I don't know. I don't know what to say about them anymore. I don't know. Because at the end of the day, the miraculous happened in which... I can't believe I'm saying this. For the first time on this podcast, Lewis Hamilton has won a race. Finally. Finally. I've waited to say that for a long time. Because, oh my god, he had chances last year. Very few, but I think he still had a chance or two somewhere. This year, he, I think he could have had a better chance in Austria. I think we could have said this a week ago. But here we are. Lewis Hamilton, in his final British Grand Prix as a Mercedes driver, gets win number 104. And the emotional reaction by his... Pitwall, Bono, which is his race engineer, the entire team, everything afterwards. It was something else. And it was a beautiful moment for Hamilton, who deserved to win the race. In the end, he should be thanking Lando Norris because he did um, block Max Verstappen for a little bit, which ultimately Max ran out of uh, laps to overtake uh, Sir Lewis Hamilton. But in the end, it goes to Hamilton in one of the more unpredictable results of the season, in which Hamilton wins a race. Six different race winners, and we're halfway through the season now. We'll be pre previewing, I believe, our next race. Is we're going to Hungary next? I think Hungary might be, or Belgium. I don't know. One of the two is next. And we'll talk about it on Friday uh, towards the back end of that episode. But the big question is now... Uh, for them throughout the grid. We'll start off with Ferrari, who looked, who looked really bad. Another poor qualifying from Charles Leclerc. S started a P11. He didn't get out of Q2. He almost got topped by Logan Sargent, who finished at 12th. He was like this close, Chet. Logan finished 11th. He just missed out on the points. I was really sad. I wanted him to get points. Because that's where he got a win in F2. And they played the United States Anthem on British soil, which is actually kind of funny because everyone brought up 1776. Fitting. But that was a big storyline. Signs got in the points. I don't know if Leclerc got points or not. I don't really remember. I can't. Pull. Let's look at the race results. Uh, did we get points uh, in Great Britain for... No. Leclerc finished 14th. Awesome. Uh, Perez in 17th, I think. Um, but it's Hamilton, Verstappen, and Lando Norris uh, being the podium. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we will be heading to the Championships Wimbledon to end the video. Now, last time we were here, I know I'm not going to be able to bring up the graphic. Um, we were in the third round or so. And let's talk about some of the more... Actually, no, let me try it. We'll try it. We'll, we'll, we'll jeopardize the whole episode for this. Uh, let's look quickly at the men's third round. Um, this part of the draw, we had... This just happened, so we'll talk about this as well. We had Yannick Sinner beat Ka Kechimonovic. Ben Shelton beat Shapovalov. And then Ben Shelton blew... He blew this third set. He was 5-1 up and lost, which special. But then Yannick Sinner played... 
Daniil Medvedev. Medvedev played Gregor Dimitrov. Medvedev won after Dimitrov got hurt. And Daniil Medvedev, because he had more stamina, in the end, beats Yannick Sinner. He advances to the quarter to the semifinals. In this part of the draw, Francis Tiafo puts up a valiant effort but gets ousted in the end by Carlos Alcaraz. He would face Umber, and then Alcaraz would beat Umber and will face the Alcaraz killer of Tommy Paul. He beat Bublik. He would then play a Batista Agut, which he annihilated Batista Agut to see that quarterfinal out. Next quarterfinal is Musetti and Fritz. Musetti, who played a very interesting match against M- Pecci. I don't even know the rest of the name, uh, but it's a long name. I'm sorry if I offended anyone. Uh, Taylor, he would play Taylor Fritz or Andre Zverev. It's turned out to be Taylor Fritz. Great match between them, those two, by the way. I honestly thought that Fritz was going to win it in four, but Zverev, who played a... This was nuts. Cam Norrie's 17-15 tiebreaker against Zverev was absolutely wild. Fritz will play Musetti in the quarterfinals. And our final quarterfinal, one that was, should have been more predictable, sees Alex Dimanur, who beat Pule, which a qualifier in the third round, fair play. Uh, he would face Feliz. Feels? Feliz? I don't know. Uh, but Dimanur would win in four. Holger Runa would then play Novak Djokovic, in which Novak Djokovic beat up Holger Runa. These are quarterfinals of Novak Djokovic against Dimonur, Taylor Fritz against Musetti, and Tommy Paul against Carlos Alcaraz. I believe one of those is going to be happening very soon because Daniil Medvedev advances uh, to the semifinals. All to play for. These are your quarterfinals once again. It is going to be absolutely crazy. On the ladies' side, more craziness. Uh, we'll go back to the third round. Uh, we'll start off with Iga Zaviatek, who bottled it against Ostapenko. Then Ostapenko beat Putin Seva to advance to the quarterfinals to play Krechkova. Uh, Danielle Collins then went out to play Haddad Maya. She beat Haddad Maya, then lost to Krechkova, which sets up that match with Ostapenko. Next part of the draw, Rai Bikina, who I have winning the whole thing, uh, beat Caroline Wozniacki. Wozniacki won one game. You knew that it was going to be a blowout. Uh, she would then play Kalinskaya, who she beat Kalinskaya after she retired. And then the bottom half, Savitolina upset Ons Jabor, who I had also doing well. Uh, and then Savitolina beat uh, uh, Wang. So it would be Savitolina, Rybakina, Kazakhstan versus Ukraine. The Kazakhstanian player versus the Ukraine player should be very fun. Uh, Lulu Sun, who has been a very big deal, uh, she got eliminated today, which is very sad. But she beat Zhu. Uh, Emma Raducanu predictably beat Maria Sakari, which set up this match. And I got to watch the whole thing. Awesome match with Lulu Sun uh, taking a lot of deuces to the end. But Lulu Sun wins. But she then loses to Vekic. Vekic, who pe- beat Badosa after Badosa upset Kazetkina. And then Vekic advances to the semifinals. Who else will join her? Well, we'll find out as J- uh, Polini. And Madison Keys both won, but then Madison Keys retired on 5-5. That was sad. I thought Madison Keys was going to win it, but Paulini wins after Keys retired. And then the big upset, Emma Navarro, who I had going out way earlier. I really underestimated her, and that's my mistake. She played Coco Goff, which Coco Goff lost, which it's up Paulini and Emma Navarro, which we'll look now at the full quarterfinal draw. That's the draw. Uh, we had, of course, Lulu's son lose already. So it'll be Paulini Navarro, winner plays Vekic, and Rybakina Savitolina, and Kretschkeva against Ostapenko. No one knows anything that's going to happen. We'll have to wait till next time to see how it all plays out. Wimbledon's nuts. Euros and Copa America are heading down the wire as well, as well as Formula One really tuning up right in the middle of the summer. But that is where we'll leave you guys today. That is the end of today's episode. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you like what you see, hit the like button down below and subscribe to the channel. But for now, I'm Robbie Basil saying so long. See you guys next time. Goodbye, everyone.